directory. Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and I'm very excited today because we have a very special guest. This is Sandri Lea, and she is a speaker, an author, and a coach for food addiction. And I'm going to quickly let her um, take it away because she has such great information to share with you on how to overcome food addiction, what it is, the treatment, and the works. So Sandra, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and let them know how they could help themselves with food addiction. Wonderful. Well, thank you for having me on, Stacey. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I am definitely a trailblazer here in Canada in the field of food addiction and soon to be in the United States as well. Um, I was one of the first certified food addiction counselors in the world. <laughs> so I actually had to go over to Iceland to write my final exam, which was no big hardship. Uh, <laughs> but I find it very interesting that Europe will uh, recognize food addiction as a diagnosis and that I am a food addiction counselor. But over here in North America, where we have an obesity crisis and we have a toxic food environment, um, they're not so willing to look at that. So that's just a very interesting little tidbit. I created an outpatient program in Ontario, where I am from and where I live. And uh, that outpatient program runs in clinics across Canada. And I created Canada's first 28-day residential program in Toronto at a place called Renaissance. So Renaissance is um, a treatment center for originally opened in the 1970s for drugs and alcohol. And then about five or six years ago, they opened their doors to food addicts. And so I helped create that program and executed that program for over a year. And I have to tell you, Stacey, that was one of the most rewarding years of my career to be in a treatment center. It was for women only um, of people trying to get over their addictions. They are the most beautiful souls you will ever, ever come across. And so I put out my very first book uh, this year in March called Never Enough the three pillars of food addiction recovery. And so the never enough has a double meaning. I think that this idea of not being enough uh, plagues almost every human, but especially women, right? We can yes. never be enough, do enough. I'm not thin enough, smart enough, fast enough. I can't love enough. I can't give enough. And that feeling of never being enough often has us reaching for solace in food, shopping, relationships, gambling, and then whatever we're using for comfort becomes never enough, right? I can never have enough shoes to make me feel worthwhile. Um, and lastly, what mostly qualifies me for this uh, job is uh, I am a food addict. And in my 20s, I was over 100 pounds overweight. And I wish I could tell you it was just my weight and my eating. But food addiction, like other addictions really devastated every area of my life. My marriage was crumbling. I had clinical depression. I was in an enmeshed codependent relationship with my mom who was living with bipolar disorder and obesity herself. And I was on sick leave. And from that really low, low point, I rebuilt my life. And it wasn't until I treated my weight and my eating like an addiction that I was able to release the hundred pounds because prior to that, I was a professional dieter. I was just looking for that magic diet, right? At that time it was keto, uh, not keto, sorry, Atkins. And there were, you know, a diets of like cabbage soup. And I used to do Nutrisystem. They're not open anymore. I did Nutrisystem before microwaves. So the food would come in these pouches that you would have to boil. <laughs> That's how old I am. Um, and thank God I never found that diet. And thank God I could never be skinny because all I wanted was to be skinny. And I thought once I was skinny, I could everything would work out. I would get the guy, the job, the house, the money. Life would be good because I grew up in the 80s and I used to watch MTV. And the girls on MTV, they looked one way and they looked happy. So I thought that was the way to achieve happiness. And yeah. because I couldn't do that with the diet, that was the fuel to change my life, to change my inner world so that my outer world could change. Yes. Yeah. You know, I find in the United States, you know, 
all over the world. We all struggle. And I think so much has to do with the media as well, because the media always painted a picture, like you said, especially in the 80s and 90s, everyone was glorified looking. Let's say you saw Pamela Anderson, you know, she was on that show and, and you saw, you saw Farrah Fawcett and you saw all, you know, the younger generation listen to this, they're going to say, who the hell are they? But, you know, it's like, but, you know, you saw all these glorified, beautiful women and, you know, so in a, in a woman's mind, it's like, I just have to look like that. And my life will be like that too. But, you know, it's, it's not easy, you know, to, to lose the weight, especially as we get older and our body starts to change every year, our body changes, our metabolism changes. And even if different illnesses and, and DNA all play a part, everything does, but you know, it's, it's a struggle, but it's also, you know, we have, we have a, we live in an area where, you know, people are always trying to lose weight. And it's not that easy to lose weight. And it, it really hurts people's self-esteem and it and it, it plays a part on how they, they care for themselves, how they love themselves. And I think it's so important, you know, to know that yes, we can lose weight. It's not impossible, but we have to do it in a healthy way. And, you know, and I know that you work very hard to show people the importance of how to lose weight healthy and what could happen with these crazy rapid weight loss, you know, that you see all over the place. You see it on the Internet. You see it on YouTube. You see it on Facebook. Rapid weight loss, you know, explain that to people and why it's not it's not a good thing because people in our society, everything needs to be fast. People have no patience. They want to see fast results. But in anything in life good things take time. And why is it not good to to indulge in those rapid weight losses? Yeah. So super restrictive diet, rapid weight loss are very dangerous. Um, We, um, you and I are sitting here today because our ancestors through the centuries were able to withstand famine. Okay. So let's just bear with me for a moment. And because um, they could go for stretches without finding food. And then when they would find food, they would be able to eat a ton of it and hold on to the calories and hold on to the weight. And that's, and then the genes would go on and here we are today. Yeah. So what happens when you go on a super restrictive diet, your brain doesn't know, oh, it's because I have a wedding to go to in a few months, your brain perceives famine. And it's an artificial famine, right? Because there is food available, but a cascade of events happens in your brain that are completely outside of your control, that the longer you're on the famine um, is going to make you want to find food, seek food and eat as much food as possible because your brain actually believes it's life or death. And then you put that person in this toxic food environment where there's tons of cues and there is fast food on every block available 24 seven. And then you have your brain driving you going eat, eat, eat. Oh my God, we're in a famine. We have to end this very quickly. So understand after every famine comes the feast And I work, I'm very grateful and, and lucky to work with some of the top obesity doctors in Canada. Canada actually is a world leader in obesity management. So just a little shout out to Canada and (laughs) I work with some of the top doctors. Um, And this is what I've learned from them. There is research to prove that every single diet works, Uh, keto, low carb, high carb, low fat, Mediterranean, low calorie, they all work in the short term, every single one of them. And we have even more overwhelming research to show that over 95% of all diets fail. Over 95. The truth is like 97, but I'm not allowed to say that. So over yeah. 95% of all diets fail. How could it ever have been your fault with those stats? Who yeah. listening to this would board a plane if the pilot said, buckle up. We got a 95% chance of crashing. Like where's the exit sign, but yet we're all waiting for that next diet. Maybe this one will work. Maybe it's this, maybe it will be. No, it's never going to work. And what happens with the diet is we've all been on them and they work in the short term. And then that cascade of events happens in our brains that are outside of our control. But what do we do? we blame ourselves. Oh, if I could have just stuck to it, if I could have been more disciplined, maybe it is my fault. It was never going to work. Never. Yes. Mm -hmm. I agree. You know, I, and 
I, I find that, you know, a lot of people that do the rapid weight loss, as soon as they stop, either two things happen a lot with a lot of my clients. One, they, 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 they start to gain that craving back their old eating habits. Cause it's, you know, even though they, they broke it for a while, they, it hasn't become a lifestyle change. It's like, cause when you, when you're forced to do something to lose weight in the back of your head, you're yeah. still, you're still craving. Yeah. Yeah. And so many people as much as hard as they work to lose the weight, you, you'll notice a lot of them gain most of it back. You know, and they work so yeah, and more and you know and and then the, you know it, it gets very depressing it, it's like an uphill battle you know uh they really 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 want to lose the weight you know so it's like but they they can't break those eating habits and sometimes in my opinion i feel like one it could be because it's a coping mechanism you know maybe people you know are using it to cope with their emotions because a lot of people use food to cope with their emotions just like addicts you know with alcohol and drugs a lot of them use it as a way to cope with unsettled feelings or trauma or you know or just the stress they're going through in their lives that are just overwhelming for them you know and some people just love food they just, it's just, it's just a love. They want to lose the weight, but they love food. And it's like a, it's like a lead magnet. It just draws them in. And as hard as they try to fight that, you know, to get away from that magnet, it just keeps drawing them in. What do you do? You know, maybe we could break it down into two thoughts and you can tell us the people who are using it as a coping mechanism and those people who just love food, you know, it's in their head. It's, it's you know, they just love it. And it's so hard for them to just stop eating the food that help is making them gain the weight. Yeah. So uh, a couple of things. Um, first, I want to make an important distinction between food and ultra processed, factory made, nutrient poor, disease causing yes. food products. So yes. let's not even talk about them in the same sentence because yes. if we all just ate real food that came from our earth with minimal processing I guess like we can't eliminate all process like chickpeas in a can is slightly yeah. processed <laughs> tuna in a can yogurt's been processed but still very healthy I'm talking about the ultra processed crap junky highly addictive food and just so everybody knows it has been engineered to be highly addictive the food yes. industry wants the biggest share of your wallet and it's highly competitive. So how do they make sure you buy this cereal instead of that cereal or this box of cookies versus that box of cookies? Well, they do a lot of science. They put people in MRI machines. They watch, you know, feed people food and watch the, the brain light up in a reward center. And yeah. if they can hit the bliss point, which is a, a term the food industry came up with, the bliss point, it's over rewarding. It can become addictive for some people, not everybody, but some people. It's no yeah. different than alcohol, right? There's many, many people out there that can enjoy a glass of wine and have no consequences from it and maybe have another glass in a week or two. And then there's people who are addicted, who one glass of wine means they're going to go down a road where they may become inebriated or don't show up for work. Or it's going to be a problem for them. Um, and that's the way it is with these ultra processed junky foods that cause disease. So that's the first step is really separating what is food and what is not food. If, right. we, if you and I could go back 120 years ago, there likely would be no food addiction because 120 years ago, there was no food on this planet that was highly addictive. Nobody yeah. can say, you know what? I had a really stressful day. I'm going to go home and eat three chickens and a bushel, a bushel of Brussels sprouts. Like that's how upset I am. You can't, yeah. you literally can't. Your body reacts to whole natural foods in whole natural ways. The chewing, the fiber, you become so satiated. Your body to stop and they've actually done studies where they've tried to incentivize people with money to overeat on whole natural foods you can't your body literally like it's too awful yeah now if we switch that to these food like substances where the full signal doesn't come on right people right. can overeat well into being fully sick um yeah. you know i always say after a hard day 
could I come home and eat six full apples, like just sit at the table and eat six apples and all that chewy, like it would be really tough, right? Even though apples are delicious and, yeah. and sweet, replace the apples with six warm, gooey chocolate chip cookies straight out of the oven, same amount of calories, maybe the same amount of sugar, not a problem, <laughs> if I'm <upset laughs> enough, not a problem. Um, so either, you know, whether we're looking at food addiction or emotional eating, or I just love food. If you just love real food, you likely won't have a problem. You might have to put in some boundaries around yeah. uh, quantities, um, but it, it doesn't ignite the hunt for more. So right. that's the thing. Ultra processed sugary foods it doesn't satiate some of us. It actually ignites the hunt for more. It's like, oh, I just ate a bag of chips. What's next? What's next? So in my 20s, I used to have a tape running all the time. Where am I going to eat? When am I going to eat? How much am I going to eat? Did I eat too much? Should I skip right. dinner? Which I never would. Did I have too little? Maybe I can have seconds or third. It was just constant, like a drug addict. But yeah. The further you are away from your trigger foods, so I call a trigger food a food that you obsess about, that once you start, it's hard to have a reasonable portion and will often lead to an overeating episode. That's a trigger food. So I never tell people what to eat or not to eat. I'm not in the business of that. I'm in the business of what is peaceful for you. What right. brings you? What can you have eat that has a beginning and an end and doesn't make you feel guilty? Doesn't make yeah. you feel bad about yourself. Food should never make you feel bad about yourself. That's your first hint that it's yeah. not a peaceful food. Because right. whenever I talk about eliminating trigger foods, and I often give talks to medical professionals, someone stands up and they always say, Sandra, that sounds really restrictive. It's never a good idea to eliminate whole food groups. And I'm like, yeah. You're a hundred percent right. So what is it about a Dorito that is a food? <laughs> Just like silence. Like, oh. Cause we can look at the ingredients package right now of a Dorito or a donut. Yeah. Right here, you're, you're, there's more chemical than food. There's a yeah. sprinkling of food, but that's, that's true of a lot of addictive substances. There's a sprinkling yes. of something natural and then we process it. Like if we look at cocaine, cocaine came from the cocoa leaf right? Yeah. That was fine. There was a time in history when a man and woman came across a cocoa leaf, they would chew on it, get a spurt of energy. It was great. And then we process, process, processed into cocaine and then crack cocaine. And then it became highly addictive and very deadly. Isn't that crazy? Oh God. Yeah. I always so, say, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'll say quickly. I always say to people, because a lot of people don't even realize what bad foods are. I say, if you turn it around, look at the ingredients. If you cannot, can't pronounce it, then obviously it's not good for you, but go ahead. I want you to keep talking. I don't want to interrupt you. No, no, that that's exactly right. And, you know, we've talked a lot about weight loss and I know that people, that's one of their goals, weight loss. And there's nothing wrong with that goal. When I work with my clients, I really ask them to, let go of weight loss. And that scares people. Like, oh, I and so I have always, I actually don't know what I weigh and I can't know what I weigh because the number on the scale has never, ever made me happy. So yeah. my weight is none of my business. It's none of my business. For me, I'm a religious person. I say like God owns my weight. And yes. then what I own is um, eating whole foods and moving my body. That's what I own and being and having a spiritual life. Yes. And then why do I need to know what I weigh? If you're doing the very best that you can, why do you need to know why you what you weigh? So I run pre COVID, I would run my programs in clinics. And it was great. I saw people real people in a room. Can you imagine? And um, I'll never forget this day, this woman came in, it was an eight week program. We were at week six. She had been doing so well. You could see it. You could see in the yeah. way she walked and the way she showed up. And when you let go of sugar and processed foods, you sleep oh, better. Yeah. Your skin looks better. You glow. You literally yeah. glow. You're, you're you really do. Food. And so she had gotten on the scale at week six and she goes, Sandra, I only lost five pounds. Like only, like as if that's nothing, right? I only lost five pounds. And I was so mad and so upset. And I've been on an eating binge ever since. And I'm like, oh my God, right? That's the power of the scale. 
what if she had never gotten on the scale and she was looking at the other things? So yes. she was looking at her improved sleep, the fact that she her libido was up, the fact that she was um, in a better mood, present for her children. She walked different. She felt different. She was starting to love herself. All that yeah. didn't matter. It didn't matter because she had only lost five pounds and she threw away everything else, all the other milestones and made the scale king. So I always say, if you cannot be neutral about the number on the scale, throw it in the trash, just throw it yeah. away, find other things to measure because it's, it, you may never get to your goal weight. Right. You may never get there. So what does that mean? Does that mean you don't get to live the life you want? And the real work is loving the body you have today, loving and enjoying the body you have today. Why? Because you're never getting this day back. You're never going to get this day back. And, you know, I turned 50 last year and I'm starting to feel it. I'm starting to feel like I can't waste any more time. There's no more, oh, I'll buy it when I'm this size, or I'll go on that trip when I'm there, or I'll do the pool party when, though, no, we've only got so much time left on this earth, and yeah. we can't wait to be the, a certain size, to enjoy life, you deserve to enjoy life today. Yeah. yeah, I agree so much with you, and I got to tell you, I am a victim of always going on the scale, and I'm trying to break that habit, because I carry a lot of water weight. So, you know, I can easily one day I could be 135. Then whatever I ate, maybe the next day, I just retain water very, I just retain it and, you know, it'll go away in a day or two, but I just happen to retain water. You know, I get, so I'll go on the scale. I could be four or five pounds heavier the next day. And that drives me nuts. I'm like, <gasps> you know, even a pound, you know, like, what did I do? You know? And but then I'll go and I'll actually use a measuring tape yeah. and I've gone my, the measuring tape tells me you're doing better than you ever have before. And such a difference, you know, and, you know, I always feel like if you really want to see if you're doing good, use a measuring tape, but you know what, don't, don't focus so much on that. How, like you said, how are you feeling? That's what matters. Are you feeling more energetic? When you're, you know, do you, like you said, is your libido up, you know, are, you know, how is your metabolism functioning? You know, do you, you know, all these things are the main things that matter, but our society has always, you see those pictures of the girl holding the, holding the scale and, you know, and you know what I was, I'm like, you know, that's the way we've been trained to think, you know, but the scale is the, our worst enemy it really really is and that's such a good point that you made because you got to break that habit if you do it and I try my best and I have to I have to I just got to throw away that scale maybe and just get rid of it because it's become a habit and it's like I want it but I always have maintained a certain plateau weight but then my inches tell me differently so you can't and, really and rely and Stacy, do you know how many women out there, their goal weight is 135 or 145 <laughs> would die to be 145 when you're, you have your water weight gain would die for that. And then you're, you're there going, oh my gosh, I've gained five pounds of water weight. What am I going to like? How does that affect your day? How do you show up? Right. It's we never know the cost of not loving and accepting ourselves. So I truly believe that the most important relationship you're ever going to have in this lifetime is the one you have with yourself. Yes. And what I believe to be true about myself will show up in my relationships, in my work, in my finances, in my home. But I don't even know this. If I'm in a place of self-hatred, self-condemnation, um, harsh internal critic, like I don't even know how bad it is until you close the door on that and you come yes. into a place of being peaceful and loving and accepting and then you're like oh all my friends are really great and I attract really great opportunities and I feel good about like whoa wait a minute is that because I made that shift and I had no idea I was in the dark for yes. for the first 20 years of my or the like not the first 10 years, but I would say from, you know, teens to 30, I was in total darkness and I didn't know yeah. all the things I was repelling. Yeah. I had no idea. 
And do you notice also with you, yourself and your clients that when you start to accept yourself, you start to glow and you start to behave different and people notice that and you can focus and you can reach your goals and, and you start to really build that self-esteem. Your whole life changes all by how you feel about yourself. Like you said, accepting yourself as the now and just, you know, in the, in the present time. And if you want to make a few tweaks, you know, like you said, look at the food you're eating and focus on the better foods but appreciate yourself for who you are now. Because I came to the conclusion, I stopped feeling the pity party and I started saying, you know what? There are a lot of other people out there, a lot worse than I am, you know? And I really need to appreciate who I am as a person and start loving that person. How do you feel about that? Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. So uh, if you do not have love for yourself, you cannot give it to others. Not truly, not that unconditional love. The way that I judge myself is the way I judge others. The more comfortable I am with my mistakes and more my shortcomings, the more comfortable I can be with yours. And so people will say, no, no, I'm not so harsh with other people. You're lying to yourself. You may be not verbalizing it, but it's in your head. Uh, people who spew hate usually have a lot of hate for themselves. And yeah. so the more at peace I am with myself, the more at peace I can be with other people. And the greatest compliment anybody can give me is that they enjoy my energy. Like I'm telling you, hands down, that is like the best pickup line, the best line. And, and I have people in my life who literally call me up and say, I just need to sit with you for a little bit. I just need uh -huh. to feel that energy. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I love you so much. And I want to be that person. Yes. And in, in contrast, in my 20s, and I still am friends with these people, they told me I had the saddest eyes that they had ever encountered. Sad me, sad eyes. Like, I, I, I can't believe that that was the way people describe me. But it was, I was just filled with so much self-hatred and self-disgust. And then those are the people I attracted, the circumstances I attracted, everything mirrored how I felt about myself. And yeah, yeah. I didn't never verbalize judgment for other people, but I did in my head because I had yeah. it for myself. Right. And you know what? I just got to ask you, you know, because you are a food addiction counselor, when I'm sure you get people that come to you and, what, and, they, and they ask you, how do I stop this addiction? What are the steps I need to do? What can I do to stop being addicted to food? I want to change. I just don't know how. I'm stuck in these habits. I'm stuck. I tried everything and nothing is working. What do I do? And so yeah. what do you, you know, cause that, that's, I think the common question, all these people are like, I keep trying to lose weight. I lose weight, but then I gain it back. Blah, blah. Just like we talked, what do you tell these clients the healthy way? What do they need to start doing? Yeah. So I've outlined uh, the three pillars of recovery in my book, never enough. So before I even get into the three pillars, yeah, the foundation has to be self-love and self-acceptance. Why? Because a lot of us had shaky foundations in our childhood. There's a huge link between childhood neglect and trauma and obesity later in life. And we didn't often get the love and acceptance that we needed. And now, and that's no one's fault. No one's responsible for what they happen to them as children. But as adults, we have to give it to ourselves. So that's the foundation. Otherwise, these pillars are built on sand. I can't build pillars on self-hatred. And right. know that self-hatred will drain you of every ounce of energy and motivation you have. And love is energizing. It is. Yeah. How much energy do you need? And then the three pillars. The first is to eliminate our trigger foods, the foods that do not bring you peace. And then people are like, I can't, I don't know. I look at it as hit, uh, archery. So mm -hmm. every morning you're going to get up and you're going to try to hit bullseye on your recovery. You're going to try to stay away from your, your trigger foods, which are processed sugary foods. And yeah. the day that you hit bullseye is going to feel amazing. It's self-rewarding. You're going to go oh. to bed and be like, it was so good. We've all had those days, right? Like you yes. ate on point, you moved, you meditated. You're like, I love myself. And mm -hmm. then you're going to wake up some mornings because you're a human being and you're not going to hit bullseye. You're not even going to hit the board. We can't even find the arrow. <laughs> like It's so bad. It's so bad. And that's yes. okay. You're human. I'm here to tell you those days are even richer. 
Mm -hmm. Because those are the days that you have to practice self-compassion and self-love. So many of my clients feel like failures because they have tried and failed, tried and failed for so many years. And they're not failures. You're absolutely not a failure. The, the diets have failed you. So I need you to start feeling like a winner. So when you hit bullseye, you're going to feel like a winner. And when you miss bullseye, you're going to practice self-love and self-compassion. There's no more losing. There's no losing at this. Then the second pillar is creating community. This is really, really important. I think we learned this through COVID. We need people. You need to be tapped into a community of people that really understand this, that mm -hmm. celebrate all those little successes and then hold you up with love when, when you fall down and you will fall down. You will yeah. absolutely fall down. And then the third pillar is mindfulness and spirituality. So addictive eating is mindless eating. And so yeah. mindfulness is one of the tools we use, but spirituality is so important because if you've struggled with your weight or you're eating for years or decades like me, it chips away at your self-esteem and your self-worth. Spirituality yes. reminds you that you are worthy. Spirituality reminds you that you were born with the spark of the divine, that yes. inside of you is this beautiful magnificence and it has not gone anywhere. Eating is not a moral issue. Weight is not a moral issue. That magnificence is inside of you. You just lost your connection. So yes. you got to reconnect to that place. Live from yeah. that place. Select food from that place. Eat from that place. And then at the top of the house that we're building is a peaceful and sane relationship with food. I like to untangle weight from eating. Eating lives on this planet um, and, and having that peaceful, neutral just beautiful, having food return to its rightful purpose, no longer using food to alter my state, not looking for comfort in food, not looking for escapism, not looking to numb out. That's not what food was intended for. Not doing that anymore. And then weight is on a different planet and it takes care of itself, but we are looking for a peaceful relationship with food. Oh, I so well said, you know, I, I, you know, it's so funny because you talk about the same principles as I do. Those principles are the principle of life. They are the principles of success. If you don't go by what you just said, you cannot do anything in life. It is so th those are just the pillars of life. You have yeah. to, you could apply those to so many things. It applies to food addiction. It applies to everything. So, so right. if, you know, it's, it's awesome. You know, now when, when, how do you start them? Like, how do you start to treat them? You know, is there a specific way now they come to you for counseling, you explain all this, they get the program, you know, and can they work with you? You know, uh, like, let's say remotely, do they have to be in a room with you or can you no. really in a way? Yeah, so COVID, that was one of the gifts of COVID, uh, that people were now open to the idea of doing remote uh, groups, and they are very beneficial. And in fact, uh, research has come out to show that group, being in a group therapy session is more beneficial than just one-on-one, -on -one because in a group, you have what's called social learning. So you have some members who are further along that inspire others that it is possible. You have accountability you have community so it's a really good modality so I have an amazing program starting on September 25th um, yeah. there's nothing like it there's literally nothing like it out there it is 90 days because I do believe you need somebody to walk with you each and every single day for 90 days if you're struggling with your weight or eating or food addiction going to one meeting a week ain't gonna cut it that's not enough in my early days, I needed support three times a week. I couldn't, I had to get my tank filled up and I could make it one day on my own. And then I had to get my tank filled up and then I could make it a day on my own. So 90 day program, it's called Why Love Matters in Weight Loss. Uh, that's the, the step everybody forgets, right? They just think, no, I need the perfect diet. I need the trainer. I need No, you cannot change your outer world and leave your inner world unchanged. That's not possible. So 90 days with me. So first thing in the morning, you're going to receive a, a video saying, hi, welcome to day eight. 
This is what we're going to focus on because I believe in giving people small digestible pieces instead of like, here's the whole program, go do it. And this program combines pre-recorded with live sessions. So it's the molding of the two. I think that just an online program that you do alone ain't going to cut it. And only live is not going to cut it either because you need to go at your own pace. Yes. So first thing in the morning, good morning, darling. Here we are at day eight. Here's what we're focusing on today. Then at night, um, as a second touch point, I have been a spiritual seeker for over 20 years. I can't, there's not enough time to tell you the retreats, the gurus, the methods, the books that I have read. But what I've done, which I don't know of anyone else who's done this, is I've taken all the spiritual knowledge that I've learned and applied it to eating. And applied it to my relationship with food because usually the spiritual teachings which they should be is about how to live life and how to have fulfillment and how to give and be and do more and i take all that and i go okay but how do i apply it to my relationship with food and so every night you get another video for me and that's the spiritual teaching that's the inner work that needs to be done and it allows your brain to marinate on that for eight hours right instead of marinating on uh what mistakes i made what do i have to do tomorrow it's like no here's your spiritual teaching yes and then on top of that we do three facebook lives a week so that's your chance to ask your questions get coached we interview top obesity doctors we do cooking lessons that's the real life community and um People have emailed me and said, I'm not on Facebook. That's totally fine. We can send you recordings if you're not comfortable being on Facebook. Um, and it's uh, it's just a really special community. I only open this program up two to three times a year. So if you don't join for September 25th, then it's got to be January because I take a cohort of people. Like I want everybody in the community. We're all on day one. We're all on day 30. And also we start on September 25th. We finish December 25th. So it really gets you to a safe, peaceful place with yourself, your body and food before the holidays, which can be really challenging for people. So you can find out more on my website, sandralea.com. So it's uh, right there in my name, easy to find. That is amazing. What I love so much about this program is it's not just a program. You're bringing spirituality in it and you're going deep down inside a person. And that's where it all stems from. You know, people's eating usually stems from something emotional going on with themselves, you know, and everybody has a different life. Everybody handles emotions differently and you're going to the root cause. And that spirituality is helping you release, find first of all that root cause, and then you're helping them heal it. So it's not just teaching them how to eat properly. You're going deeper than that. And that usually makes any type of program so successful. And not many people do it like that. You don't find programs like that. That's very unique. And I like that a lot. I really, really like that a lot. And I've seen in the past, any type of program that brings spirituality into it and not just a plan and that you bring it into a group session and that you're constantly with them. That's, that's the, the road Power. to success. It's powerful. And you will, I can't say you will, you know, there is a high percentage that you will succeed because that really is a very productive way to go. And that is a very healing way. And it will probably heal you in more ways than just food addiction. It will probably change your life. It really, <laughs> that's great. Now tell you everybody. Yeah, I you get, get it. it totally. You I get, get it. it. I get it. And and you also tell everybody about the book you wrote. So they, if they want to go grab your book, they know the title and where they could find it. Yeah. So the title is Never Enough, Three Pillars of Food Addiction Recovery. So it's sold anywhere books are sold online. Doesn't matter if you like Indigo, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, they're all, it's everywhere. Um, and if you can't remember that whole title, just do Never Enough Sandra Leah and it'll it'll come up. There's only one me out there. Um, <laughs> and that is a, 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 a wonderful companion to the 90 day program. I should mention that the 90 day program, I've made it super accessible at $119 for 90 days. And I did that purposefully. And if you go to my website, you'll see I have many programs and a lot of they're quite expensive. They're very touch point. I'm, you know, I'm the top Canadian food addiction counselor 
but I wanted to create something very accessible for people. And the yes. book is a fantastic accompaniment to the program. Uh, it's part memoir and it's part uh, workbook. So I've, I've molded the two because in clinic, I always teach, but I teach through storytelling and I bring a lot of my own stories and the stories of my mother who lost her life at 69 to obesity and food addiction. And my mother always used to say to me, what have I done with my life? What have I done? Right. Cause she had felt that she hadn't lived her potential. And yeah. And so for me, uh, writing that book and bringing her story to life is giving meaning to, yeah. to her life. And I always use my life stories to be of service for pe to people um, because theory is not enough. You have yeah. to understand how it works practically and you have to understand that you're not alone. Anything yeah. that you have done with food, I've done worse. Right. Anything that you have done to your body, I'm telling you, I've done as well. There's yeah. nothing, I've never heard anything in the 10 years and the thousands of food addicts that I have helped that has ever shocked me, ever. You try, try. Like it's <laughs> all I got is love. All I got is love for you. Um, and, and oftentimes just being in a space where somebody gets you and accepts you and loves you, sometimes that's enough to heal too. Um, oh so the, yeah, it's really my life. It is my life, my journey. It's I um, the forward was written by Dr. Vera Tarman. So Dr. Tarman is the leading expert. She is a medical doctor. She's an addictions doctor. She is the leading expert in the world on food addiction. And she wrote the forward, which I'm very honored. We've worked Stop. together many times. And I have advanced praise from Dr. Sean Wharton, Dr. Sandy Van, Dr. S uh, Peter Selby. These are all people working in the field. So uh, my program has been run in medical clinics. It's not just, <clears throat> you know, I always worry. My daughter's 12. And social media obviously has a big impact on her. And she's more on TikTok. And I worry when she comes across somebody who says, uh, I'm an expert, uh, I did it. And, and I look and it's somebody who's 20 years old, who genetically they were always going to be thin. <laughs> like it doesn't matter what they do, but they yeah. decide that they're going to use the the genetic lottery that they won to sell a shake, and that the answer is in the shake. Uh, it's yeah. not. Uh, there's not one single diet that will work for everyone. That's mm -hmm. ridiculous to believe, right? And so for me, I get it. Everybody listening is intelligent you already know what to eat and not to eat. You might need some tweaking from a professional, but you already have, you already know. And so right. then it becomes how, how do I stick to whatever program works for you when I'm stressed, when I'm lonely, when I'm anxious, when I don't feel like it, how do I stick right. to this? That's the real question, not what is the program? It's like, yes. how do I stick to it once I find it? Yeah. And I think that's, that's so important is learn how to stick with it. It becomes a lifestyle change. And that's what people have, you know, the word diet should never be in a, in a vocabulary. It's a lifestyle change. Once you learn how to live and connect yourself, not just physically, emotionally, spiritually, and you have a plan set and you, you were taught a strategic goal. Don't think of it as something you have to do. Think of it as a lifestyle change, a lifestyle change that will change your life forever in a positive sense. And that's exactly what you're doing. And I have to say, Vera, Dr. Vera Tarman came on our show and she is amazing. She, she was just a, a whirlwind of information. And not only was she a whirlwind of information, she is a, a, a sweetheart. And you are so lucky to have her in your book because she is so knowledgeable when it comes to food addiction. She is just a amazing and i'm so glad that she actually wrote you know the the a part yeah the forward of your book that is amazing what an but honor she, that was it, such an honor that she did that for me that's very exciting she is she is just a whirlwind information she is one of the best in the world and she you know besides you of course and she <laughs> And she, you know, to get her to write in your forward, that just shows your credibility right there, you know, because yeah. she will not do that for anyone. She, you know, no. <laughs> and yeah. we work together, I would say for about five years. So it's, it's, oh, we've wow. known each other, work together and you're right. And so when she agreed to write the forward, I was floored, floored. <laughs> I have a huge regard and huge respect for Dr. Vera Tarman. 
Yeah, she is great. And now you also do speaking events. Yeah. So well, you know, because I'm sure there's lots of people out there that would love to have you at a speaking event. And, you know, for the for the event planners out there, or for people who work, you know, maybe at hospitals or, you know, anywhere, you know, even even just events where because food really plays a role. If you're affected by by food and you're it, it is affecting you emotionally and physically, it's affecting you at your job also. So people yeah. really have to have a clear understanding of how to keep themselves healthy. So really, you your, your, your speaking events could help people all over the place. So tell yeah. people a little about what you speak about and where they can, you know, find you if they want to book a speaking event with you. Oh, wonderful. So again, on my website at sandralea.com. Um, so the stage is absolutely my happy place. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as a hobby, I speak competitively. <laughs> so I know I always heard that one of the biggest fears people have is speaking on stage. I actually do it competitively. I've had a couple of my talks go viral. They were on love and another one about risk taking, but my heart is always on speaking about food addiction, obesity. I've done Canadian, I did a Canadian roadshow, hit seven cities across Canada, talking about obesity as a disease. We need to understand that it is not a lifestyle choice, that there are many contributing factors to obesity, many outside of people's control. I yes. often talk to medical professionals about stigma and bias and how to help patients. Um, even simple things like not asking a patient to get on a scale as soon as they enter an appointment because you're yes. signaling to them that's the most important thing. And, you know, I used to get pushed back in the Alexander, it's just a data point and we have to take it. I go, okay, that's fine. But if they gain weight, they're not coming back for their second appointment. You know that. And they're like, yeah, that is true. I go, yeah, because you've told them by the signal, you could say whatever you want. Oh, it's not important. It's a data point. But if I walk in and the first thing you make me do is get on the scale, my brain is saying that's the only way you're measuring me. So things yeah. like that help train on uh, stigma and bias. I'm always happy to talk about treatment options uh, for food addiction. I'm going to be at the National Addiction Conference in Denver in October, um, helping people with treatment because once we diagnose food addiction, it's like, well, now what do we do? How do we treat? How do we practically take people through programs? Like Exactly. Oh, congratulations. I'm so excited to hear that you're going to be speaking in Denver. You know, that's, you know, and that that's something that I think is so important. You know, people in America need to hear you speak because something like this will be very beneficial, you know, and congratulations and kudos to you. I am so glad that you came on the show and thank you so much for sharing all this valuable information. Is there anything or any tips or any last words you'd like to tell the audience before we go? Yeah, if you are struggling with weight or obesity, it's really important to know that there is absolutely nothing wrong with you, nothing. We all come into this world wanting to flourish and to be well and to grow. And so if you're struggling with your weight, something has gone wrong, something, but there's nothing wrong with you. Something has gone wrong and seek treatment because you cannot do it alone. Yes. Oh, wonderful words of advice. You know, it's very powerful. Thank you so much, Sandra, for being on the show. This has been amazing because this is something you know, we all struggle with weight loss because we all have so many people. We all we all tend to put high expectations on ourselves and some of them are not realistic and some of them are just hard to attain. And, you know, or we just don't know what to do because if sometimes people that are struggling with weight loss or, or food addiction, they feel like they're on a highway and they feel like there's seven different directions to go and they don't know where to go because, and they've been trying everything like we talked about in the beginning of this and you, nothing seems to work. So they give up and then their self-esteem drops and then their, their emotional, you know, disappointment and then depression, you know, frustration, all this stuff starts to set in. So it's very important that they tackle this problem as soon as possible. And they find somebody like you who has such an emotional, a spiritual 
and a productive, powerful way of helping people that will lead them in a, in a good direction and not only help them with food addiction, but it seems like your program and your way of thinking will help them in all areas of your life. So I really give you kudos. Thank you so much for being on the show. This has been an amazing experience and thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. This has been such a pleasure to talk to you and, and to be understood and heard. And you get this in a very unique way. So thank you. I'm sure your community, it just, it, you're doing such great work for them. So thank you. Thank you. And you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.